Colossians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 9 through 14. We've been taking the first Sunday of the month and looking at ways that we can get closer to God this year. And of course, last week we had a little bit of a special service. Our schedule changed a bit. I know it's the second Sunday for those of you that think pastors got senile. I am senile, but this has nothing to do with it. And uh, so tonight we're going to look at another way that we can get closer to God. Look here in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 9 through 14 as a bit of a, uh, as our text this evening. And we're going to look at, break down some of the verses here tonight. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, but I love that, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption. There it is again in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray together. Lord, again tonight we praise you for redemption. I thank you for paying the price for me. Lord, not only for me, you paid the price for all mankind, that all the world might be saved. Lord, sadly, men in our world don't know the gospel message. Lord, there are many who reject it. Lord, I thank you that the Bible is still true when it says whosoever. Lord, I thank you that it's not a limited atonement. I thank you that your grace is sufficient. And Lord, tonight as we praise you again for salvation, for redemption, for the shed blood, Lord, we approach the subject again. Lord, as a church family, of how we can get closer to you. Now, Lord, as we pause to open your word, as we study, Lord, I pray you'd challenge us. Lord, I pray you would get us out of our selfish attitudes. God, get us out of our self-focus. And Lord, I pray that we would learn to pray for others. And Lord, in so doing, get closer to you. Lord, I believe you have a purpose for us, everyone, this evening. And Lord, I pray that you would use your word mightily by your spirit in our hearts. Lord, meet the need on every heart here. Lord, not only those gathered here, but Lord, those that are not able to be here in person, those that are connected online, those that may see this message later. Lord, I pray that you would use it to your glory in every heart and every life. Bless us now and help us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Most of our prayers, and by the way, when I say our, I'm talking about mine and yours, all of us. Most of our prayers are centered around asking for physical, financial, or domestic benefits for us. By the way, God wants us to go to him. The Bible says, Ye have not because ye ask not. But I think if we filtered and, and did a study on our prayer, we'd find that most of our prayer is for us. Years ago, when matter of fact, I think around the time I met my wife, I was working for a company called Bar Processing. I used to tell people I worked at a bar. I did. It was called Bar Processing. Uh, had nothing to do with alcohol. Uh, we took steel bars, all different sizes of steel bars, and uh, we polished them, we straightened them, we polished them, we turned them down. 
we did all kinds of stuff with the steel bars. Well, I worked when I first started there. I was running a machine called a polisher. And it, these two giant drums that kind of offset and, and they rotated uh, together and there was this coolant that went down and the, the bar would go between them and it would polish uh, and somewhat straighten those bars of steel. And literally, uh, I, I sat there and did this. How many have ever done a job like that? Now, I had to set up the machine, I had to deal with failures, I had to adjust it. But much of my night I spent pressing the button to automate the, the bar to come down, to shoot it through, to feed through the machine, or I had to back it up, I had to stop it. That's what I did when I started the job. Now, I simply ran a piece of equipment. I didn't run the company. I, I, I didn't have a share of stock. Uh, I didn't even know what stock was, Brother Ahmad. I still don't really understand what it is. Uh, where I'm from, stock is like cattle and horses, but pigs maybe, maybe that's stock. I don't know. Uh, I was telling uh, Carrie the other day, I think we have livestock. A Yeti's actually a horse. He's not a dog. But that's the only stock that I have. But the company went through kind of a, a change up and, some managerial changes, and one of the managers, the manager, uh, who ran uh, the shift that I worked on, he was a Christian, and uh, he was uh, very uh, friendly towards uh, the few of us that worked there that were uh, from worked went to a Bible college. And one night he came to me. And he said, "Brian," he said, "we're having some trouble." He said, "We're losing money." And I said, I didn't take it. It was a mod. I didn't take it. Uh, I said, no, what you, I didn't do anything. He said, no, 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 no. You're, nobody's taking money. He said, we're, we're not making the profits we should make. And he said, I, I want to find out where we're failing as a company. I thought he was going to say, and we've decided it's you, so you're out of here. But he said to me, and I, some of you are going to be shocked by this. He said, somebody told me that you, you know how to run computers. Now, this was 19... 90, late 1994, and we're talking a high-tech period of computers, and uh, I actually grew up as a bit of a computer nerd. Uh, I had a Commodore 64. I got a Commodore 64. How many of you ever had one of those, Commodore 64 computer? I got that when I was, I don't know, I think I was 10 years old, and I learned to program in basic by the time I was 12. I learned some C++, some Turbo Pascal. Any of you know those words? Those scary, oh, there we go, my, 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 my people right there. Uh, I, knew some compu I knew computers. I are a computer nerd. I was. And he said, do you know how to do spreadsheets? I said, absolutely. He said, okay. He said, you're no longer doing this. He said, your job, he said, the job has never existed before. He said, you're, you're going you're gonna to create, I'm creating a position, you're going to define it. He said, I want you to create a spreadsheet and a tracking mechanism so we can track downtime and we can find out where we're losing money. And all he gave me was a computer and a room to work in. That was it. Now, I went to work in my steel toed boots, my Centaj uniform. Uh, looked like a, an old gas pump attendant, Miss Lois. That's the kind of uniform I had on. And I in a gr nasty, grimy, greasy, disgusting office. And I set at a computer and I created a means whereby to track the problems. I was not a well-liked person in the company after that. You know why? Because we found out where the problems were. We found out the people that were sucking time <laughs> and not putting in the effort uh, we found out machinery that needed to be fixed. We found out where we were losing money. Why? Because we began to track it. I'm afraid that if somebody came into your prayer life and my prayer life and said, hey, I'm here to help you track your prayer life. We're going to chart it out. Can I tell you what they'd find in my prayer life and yours? We'd find out that most of our prayer is 
We're like that little baby bird in the nest. <laughs> and by the way, that baby bird's not saying, hey, feed my brother. Hey, feed my brother. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, feed me. That's where most of our prayer is. Can I tell you that Jesus Christ came to this earth and died in your place, was buried and rose again, redeemed you. And can I tell you the heart of Christ? He said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. He who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords allowed himself to be born in a stable, allowed himself to be of no reputation, the Bible says. He was despised, rejected, and hated, and yet he died. Why? For others. For others. And Christians, I believe tonight we see here in Colossians a picture a picture of a man who had, I believe, one of the closest relationships with the Lord Jesus Christ that we have recorded in this Bible. A man by the name of Paul. A man who knew what it was to be a disciple. We talked about that this morning. But I simply want to spend a few moments tonight as we kind of get out of the way the reality of what our prayer life is. I want us to get beyond that. And I want us to talk about tonight how we can get closer to God by praying for others. No magic formula. No sprinkle of a magic powder to make it all better. What we do have is a pattern of God's Word. And I want to share some very simple truths with you. In verse 3 and verse 9 especially, look there with me. We give thanks, Paul here pinning the words God gave him to pen to the church at Colossae. For we give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Look at verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We see three things here in this passage, three characteristics of, of Paul's prayer for others. Three characters, and this is just foundational here tonight. I've got several points I want to give you, but before we get to those three characteristics, we see of Paul's prayer for others, and I believe we ought to have in prayer, not only just, Lord, give me. God wants us to pray to him. God wants us to call out to him. God says you have not because you ask not, but I believe we learn to get closer to God, and we get closer to the mind of Christ when we pray for others. Three attributes here we see in verse 9, persistency. Persistency. We do not cease to pray for you. How many parents here tonight? Those of you that are parents, how many of you remember when your children, some of you have children that age now, who are two, three, four years old? Maybe even, you still hear it, <laughs> maybe older than that. Mommy? Mommy, 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 mom, mom, mommy. How many of you mothers, you've heard, you've heard that before? You still hear that, don't you, Miss Friesen? I'm sorry. I'm trying to get them to stop that. But <laughs> Daddy, daddy. Now, daddy doesn't hear because daddy's normally deaf. And uh, I think it's actually on purpose. Uh, dads get deaf on purpose so they don't have to hear it. But it's that persistency. That, what? Now, you don't answer because it's convenient. You answer because you can't take it anymore. They're like, no, stop! They're persistent. They're persistent. Christian, can I tell you that Paul's prayer for others was persistent? Number two, Paul's prayer for others was intense. Intense. Notice in verse 9. For this cause we also, since today we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. It was not a, oh yeah, Lord bless them, amen. It was intense. It had a purpose. It was a desire. How many of you are hungry right now? How many of you have thoughts of, of food right now in your mind? How many of you that are hungry, you had your hands up. How, ma how many of you like uh, ribeye steak. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, if I, I'm not going to do it, but if I had Caleb put pictures up 
of ribeye steak. Don't do it, Caleb. I'll get hungry. If I had Caleb pop pictures of barbecue, coals stacked deep and hot, big two-inch thick, praise the Lord, prime grade ribeye, sitting there reverse seared, the only way ribeyes are supposed to be cooked, getting that crushed on top. Brother Bonnie, you got a little drool underneath your mask right now. If you saw those pictures, every one of you would sit there, even those of you that didn't, weren't hungry before. You'd be like, man, now I'm hungry. I want to eat something. And now you're all mad at me. Why? Because those of you that were hungry, now you're really hungry. It's intensified. Can I tell you Paul's prayer was intense for others? You know, we have no problem being intense in our prayer when it's for us, when we have a great need. Oh, God, God, I need you. God, I have to have this. When's the last time your prayer was intense for others? Paul's prayer for others was intense. Number three, and this is just foundational here. We're going to get to some points in a moment. In verse 9, I want you to notice another word. For this cause, we also, we it wasn't just Paul. It wasn't Paul saying, I am praying for you, although he was. Paul was praying with others, for others. That, that's key right there. Paul was praying with others, for others. Now, I want to give you some points tonight, seven points, seven ways that we find here just in this passage, seven things that we see the Apostle Paul prayed for that God gave from the pen of the church of Colossae and to us tonight. Number one, look at verse nine. Now, I want us to use these points and this truth here that we can shape and model our praying for others. Now, we see the prayer was persistent, it was intense, it was in unity, and we ought to have those three things, but we got to have some direction. we got to know what way to go. You know, if uh, uh, Josh, if Josh was a truck driver, and you haven't been a truck driver for a while, but if he was a truck driver, and I had a load of ribeye steaks, and I said, Josh, here, I need you to deliver these ribeyes. I gave him a whole, imagine a whole refrigerated truck full of ribeyes. I'd, I would probably rob it. Uh, I'd wear a mask and write it down. Miss Lois, you'd come with me, wouldn't you? Bring your pistol. Uh, we'll, we'll rob it just like they robbed the old trains when you were a little girl. And we'd go after it. Now, if I said, here, here's, here's a truck, here's a semi with a trailer full of ribeye steaks, go deliver it. Josh is going to look at me and say, uh, um, okay, <laughs> i got to deliver it, but where? <laughs> How? <laughs> when? Those would be important things for him to know. Christian, some important things for you to know and for me to know on how to pray for others. And I really and truly believe as we pray for others, our prayer life takes a level higher that gets us closer to God. Number one in verse 9. I want you to see what Paul prayed for. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom, and notice this, and spiritual understanding. Christians, can I help you? Can I help you in how to pray for others? Not, not my philosophy, not what I think, but what we see here in Scripture. Number one, we see he prayed that they might have perception or the Bible word here, spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding. Do you know one of the reasons that some of our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ, make wrong decisions? Because they don't have spiritual understanding. They're not making decisions based on spiritual understanding. Just like when I was a boy and I told my sister, I don't think I have any coins, but I told my sister that nickels were worth more than dimes because nickels were bigger than dimes. Brother Jojo, you're not supposed to do that. That's, that's called lying. It's called stealing. 
And so anytime we had someone give us coins, now I grew up in a day and age when, you know, you didn't get a dollar. You got, here's a quarter, here's a nickel, here's a dime. How many of you remember that? Or here's a penny. <laughs> I remember getting pennies when I was a kid. And anytime someone gave us change, I'd say to my sister, I love you so much. I want you to have the best. I was, I was a deceptive little rascal. Uh, I remember literally the night that I got saved, five years old. I remember thinking that night, I am going to burn in hell forever. Because I robbed my sister and I lied to her and stole money from her. And can I tell you, I was right. I was just as much guilty of hell as the guy who murdered somebody. Just as much guilty of hell as the one who robbed that truck full of steaks. Miss Lois, I'm just as guilty as you were. But I, I convinced her. That's, that's, it's bigger. It's worth more money. My sister's two years younger than me. She didn't have the perception to say, hold on a minute. A dime is worth 10 cents and a nickel's worth 5 cents, so you're lying to me. She just said, oh, thank you. Here you go. No perception. Christian, can I encourage you as we seek to get closer to God to learn to pray for one another? Learn to pray for spiritual understanding. Pray not, Lord, help them to see it the way I see it. That's what you want to pray. Can I tell you what that is? That's you going, okay, Lord, give it to me. Now we think, oh, I'm, I'm praying for my uh, brother or sister in Christ, but I wish they'd see it my way. No. Wish they'd see it the Lord's way. That spiritual perception, number two. Number two, look, if you will, again here at verse, look at verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I love that in verse 10. All pleasing. Number one, as we pray for others, may we pray, first of all, that they have spiritual understanding, they have perception. Number two, pray that they might be pleasing to the Lord. Here's another danger, another pitfall. Lord, I wish that he would please me. Lord, help, help her to please me. Help my coworker to please me. Help my family member to please me. Help my church member, uh, brother and sister in Christ, to be pleasing to me. But rather, we see Paul praying. Under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God gave him the words to pen to be pleasing. To be pleasing here in verse number 10. Unto the Lord. Unto the Lord. Unto all pleasing. You know, we like to be pleased. We like to get things our way. We, uh, it was at Burger King's. I'm on the food theme here. Uh, have it your way. We, we want to be pleased. We want it our way. We want what we want. And when we do that, we get farther away from God, not closer to Him. When we say, God, give me my will. God, give me what I want. God, help them to be what I want. We're not getting closer to God. We're getting closer to the devil. As the devil said, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend to the heavens. I We're following the same path. Our pride is elevated again and again. A month and a half ago or so, maybe two months ago now, and we're going to have to do it this week. I had to put some more water in the baptistry. That's because Miss Lois keeps drinking it every Sunday. She comes and gets a big glass. And, or it evaporates, one or the other. And I put the water hose in, turned the water on. We were here working on a Saturday. I was in my office. Pastor Price was here. He was, he was doing some drywall mudding. And I don't know what I... I think Darren was sleeping in the back somewhere. And, uh, I, Bernard was here. And I heard Bernard say, Pastor! Only his voice is much deeper than mine. You were here, weren't you, Brother Bonnie? I think. Oh, you weren't here? I came running well, as fast as I run. And water is 
Corey. We had we were the only church in this part of Edmonton with a waterfall uh, in our building. Water is pouring over the baptistry. And we went and shut the water off, and I forgot it was on. It was overflowing. Now, we need to fill it again, but Brother Darren, help us not to do that again. We're going to make sure that doesn't happen. But it was coming out. It, it was flooding over. Uh, it was coming over over the edge. You know, so often we want to have the blessings pouring on us just like that water was pouring out over the edge. We want everybody else to pour out on us. We want them to please us. But Christian, we need to pray for others and ask God to help others to be pleasing, not to us, but pleasing to Him. You see, that's what matters. That's why Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, thy will be done. It's not about my will or yours. It's about his will. Number three, look at verse 10 again. Another aspect of praying for others and getting closer to God, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every Good work. Number three, as you pray for others, pray that they will be profitable in service. When we see fruit bearing in scriptures, it's speaking about service for the Lord. The Bible talks about some may bear a hundredfold. The Bible tells us that we will produce fruit as believers as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they would be profitable. They would be profitable in service. Now, that'd be like if you worked for a company. Brother Bonnie, you still work for the Eco Station? Is that owned by the city of Edmonton? Brother Bonnie, it'd be real easy for Brother Bonnie to say, Lord, please help the Eco Station to make a lot of money so they can give me a raise. That'd be an easy prayer for you to pray, wouldn't it, Brother Bonnie? Lord, please help us to swindle the public out of lots of money. Uh, so we... I'm just teasing. Please, please, please bless my boss. Please bless the city. Bless the, fill the coffers full that they might share with me. That, that's an easy prayer to pray. It's not talking about profitable to us. We're to pray that others will be profitable to the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a world where we only care about people. We're conditioned in our culture. We're conditioned by the world system to only care about those that can do something for us. And if they can't do anything for us, we want nothing to do with them because they're useless. Can I tell you, as we pray for others... We need to pray, Lord, help them, help her, help him to be profitable to you in service. Lord, I, I pray that you'd bless that church, bless that brother, bless that individual. God wants us to pray for others to be profitable to him. By the way, I, I see it. I, I I've been pastoring now for almost 16 years. I was 12 years old when I started. Miss Lois, you were 30. And i got to be real honest with you. I found something unusual, and I still find it unusual and sad to me that, and not folks that I'm close with, but I, I knew people. I met people when I came to Canada, and I, I know of people, not men that I'm close to, but folks in ministry that are upset, that get upset when God uses and blesses other people. I never understood that. I, for instance, whenever Brother Jackson came up and uh, shared burden with us many years ago that they were uh, going to come to Edmonton and start a church, I said, man, I said, I'm, that's awesome. I said, how can we help? I told him, and I, you could ask him, he'll tell you this is true. I said to him, I said, I wish there were 20 other men just like you on their way to Edmonton right now. I said, I wish there were churches popping up on every street corner. Why? Because every soul that's saved, every person that hears the gospel, 
I'm not talking about false churches. I'm not talking about false religions. I'm talking about true Bible preaching churches and, and ministries that are speaking the truth of the Word of God. We ought to be praying that they are blessed, uh, that they have profitability and service. Every report I hear, every time I hear of a ministry and a blessing, it doesn't challenge me as far as, oh man, I, I don't think we're going to measure up. It encourages me. Boy, we ought to be praying for others. We ought to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ that God would bless them, that they would be profitable in ministry. And I've got to hurry here. Look at verse 10. Let's continue on. That you might walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And here it is, and increasing, not in the knowledge of the world, increasing in the knowledge of God. Can I tell you what we see here? We see Paul praying for progress. Progress. Praying for growth. Praying for growth. How many of you know the Christian life is not like this? Now, without sin and without the influence of the world, <laughs> maybe. But can I show you what the Christian life normally looks like? Because of the world and the flesh and the devil. The valleys, the mountaintops. Growth, little by little. My wife and I, just before we came to church tonight, I saw just a video clip. and I saw the person and then I saw the picture and I saw this guy that was an actor who was at 1.520 pounds, I think. A big guy. And then I saw a picture of him, and I, we watched for a second. He looked like, uh, Brother Milton would be one of the only people that knows, looked like Lou Ferrigno. Looked just like a young Lou Ferrigno. I'm like, what in the world? We're talking a guy that was bigger than me, 500 and some pounds. And here's a picture of this guy. I'm sorry, I have no muscles. I can't do it, but it looked like Lou Ferrigno. By the way, for those of you uh, my age or older, that's the guy that was painted green and played the Incredible Hulk years ago. Uh, more famous for uh, his muscles, but he also was the Incredible Hulk. But, and I thought, wow. And my wife said, how? How did he go from to that? And I didn't get a chance to watch. I watched about three seconds of the video just because I was like, what is that? And I heard just him say that he has started dating someone, and now it is his wife, and they have children together. And he said, when we started dating, she was into exercise and, and hiking and fitness. And I realized if I'm going to have a relationship, a long relationship with this woman, something has to change. By the way, it didn't happen overnight. And I guarantee you, I want to watch the rest of the video. I want to see the pro. I want to, I want to hear a story. Why? Because I love stories of growth. I love seeing people that make progress in their life. And what I love even more than physical progress, health progress, is spiritual growth. I love seeing spiritual growth. I love seeing people grow in the Lord. She's not able to be here tonight, I'm sure. She'll probably watch this on YouTube this week. But I remember the night that I knocked on Navinka's door to make a Comiskey. It was a bad night. <laughs> it was one of those nights where everybody I, everybody I talked to yelled at me, cussed at me, didn't want nothing to do with me. And that, her house was the last door. I thought, when I get to that house, I'm done. I'm not, not talking to any more people. <laughs> and I didn't go to that door and say, oh, I, uh, I'm going to pray that God will give me great power and boldness. And the Lord has... No, I didn't do that. I went, boy, I hope nobody's home. I knocked on the door, but I, I was hoping nobody would answer. And I'll be honest with you, in my heart, when I heard the voice and I saw the doorknob turn, I'm like, oh, no. Somebody else is going to yell at me. I just got chewed out on the next the house right beside of there. 
She opened the door, and I said to her, I had Elizabeth with me. By the way, Elizabeth had to break up a fight on the church bus today. Uh, she got her hair pulled, got, got her face scratched. And I said, boy, all those years of fighting with your sisters paid off. But Lizzie was this tall. Stuart was with me that night, Stuart and me and Lizzie. And I asked her, I said, ma'am, I said, if you died tonight, you know for sure you go to heaven. And I said, would you like to know? She said, I sure would. Come inside, sit down at my table. I remember that night, the night that Namika got saved. I've seen many, many, many Christians, baby Christians grow in the Lord. But as I think back to seeing little by little, every time she saw something in the Word of God and realized, oh, okay, I've got to do this, this is what the Lord wants, that decision was made. Growth was made. Some of you remember when you got saved, remember being confronted with the Word of God and, oh, this is what the Lord wants. And you had decisions to make, decisions of growth. Praise God for that growth. But Christian, can I tell you, it shouldn't stop a year after you get saved. It shouldn't stop when you're a baby Christian. It should continue until you see him. And we ought to be praying for others, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they keep making progress. Not praying, Lord, I wish you'd do something about uh, that Bonnie Dingle. But rather, Lord, I give Bonnie growth. Lord, help him in his spiritual growth. Lord, help him in his progress. Increase him. Not, Lord, I bring him where I am. That's what we want to pray. Lord, I wish they, they, they'd think and be like me. There's the devil's thoughts again. But as we get close to the mind of Christ... As we get closer to him, Lord, bless them. Help them to progress to be more like you. When's the last time you prayed for someone else's growth? When's the last time I prayed for somebody else to progress in their Christian life? Look at verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Number five here we see Paul was praying for these members of the church at Colossae, that they might be endued with power. That they might have the power of the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you what God empowers you for and empowers me for? To do His will. Jesus told, uh, told those gathered around that ye shall receive. He gave them a promise in Acts chapter 1 that they would receive the Holy Spirit, for what purpose? That you will be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. That power was not so they could walk around and say, hey, hey, look at me. Look how awesome I am. Look how spiritual I am. Not at all. It was so they could do the work God gave them to do. Why do you stop? Well, Jojo, why do you stop at a gas station? Waste time. I hate wasting time at a gas station. Why do you get out, put your credit card in the gas pump, stick the nozzle in your car, squeeze the trigger, and watch your bank account being drained? Why do you do that? Why do we put gas in our car? Because we have to use our vehicle. And how many of you know that vehicles don't run without gas? If you've never run, run out of fuel, let me tell you, if you drive them until the E, and then you wait past the E a little while, eventually it goes, and it becomes a lawn ornament. It doesn't go anywhere. You have to put gas in it. We don't buy gas because we want gas. We don't drive around going, hey, I got a full tank of gas. No. You get gas so you can... Get from point A to point B. God gives us His Holy Spirit to serve Him. He empowers us for His purpose. We need to pray for one another that God would embolden and empower 
and endue with power our brothers and sisters in Christ. For what purpose? To do his work. To share the gospel. To reach the world. To love others. By the way, God empowers you to love others. God empowers us to show forth Christ, to live as Christ. Number six, two more points I want to give you quickly here. Verse 11. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. This is a anomaly, these words. It's a, it's a bit of a juxtaposition of words for us in our culture. Words that are going together here that that doesn't quite make sense. How many have ever heard of a peanut butter and mayonnaise sandwich? Have, have you eaten one, Joyce? I haven't either. I, I remember a guy one time, we're eating lunch, and I said, what do you have? He said, peanut butter and mayonnaise. I got up and walked away and sat somewhere else. That's the truth. I thought, man, anybody that would take peanut butter and mayonnaise and put it together, something's got to be wrong with them mentally. they got to be deranged. Uh, I can't be around that. That might be contagious. Now, I know there are people that say that's good. But, Bonnie, that's disgusting. That's just not right. That's just wrong on way too many levels. It's like, let's get back to ribeye steak. That's like taking ketchup. And putting ketchup on a ribeye. I believe that you should get the death sentence in this country if you do that. I believe I should run for political, political office. I, you'd all vote for me for that. My, my platform is death to those who put ketchup on ribeyes. They just don't go together. Now, there's a couple of words here that in our ideology, in our world, they don't seem right together. But they are in God's economy. Look here at this verse. The last part of verse 11. Unto patience and long-suffering. Now, now those two things, they kind of go together. Patience and long-suffering, sure. But look at that last word. With joyful now. Joy, joyfulness. Joyfulness. How many of you like waiting? Imagine that. Nobody likes to wait. We like instant gratification. We, we want it something, and we want it now. If we have to wait in the drive through window for more than a minute, it drives us crazy. By the way, that's the industry standard, at least when I worked in a drive through back in 1993, or 92 I started. The industry standard is they wanted us to have people through in under a minute. When I was uh, 17 years old, when I started working there for a place called Long John Silvers in the U.S., we built, or I didn't build it, I worked it there while they built a drive through So a few months after I started there, we had a drive through And it was the first drive through that Long John Silvers had ever had in that area. And we were told all the stuff we had to do, how it had to happen. And they told us they wanted us to have a one-minute time of the orders going through, less than a minute at the window. And they had inside the drive through window, they had a timer. I'm not sure if any of you ever worked in drive through before or not. Maybe they do this still. I don't know. They had a timer, running timer, that showed how many seconds you've been there. And they also had that timer outside. Uh, that's not a good idea. But they had a timer. That was probably a real bad idea where the people outside could see the time as well, how long they've been there. And the way it worked, of course, this is 1992. This is old technology. There was a sensor when the car was there, and then when the car pulled away, it would reset itself. So I was working the drive through and I said to all the people who work with me, hey, this is how it works. Before it gets to a minute on the timer, whoever's working drive through I didn't tell it, I told everybody this but the manager. I said, if you're working drive through before it gets to a minute, reach your hand out the drive through window. Cover the sensor, move your hand off the sensor, it'll reset it to zero. <laughs> 17 year old genius. We had the fastest drive through time in the nation. That's God's honest truth. Look it up Gallopolis, Ohio, Long John Silvers, 1993. Fastest drive through time in corporate history. Depending on the rest of it, they still do it. 
Yeah. My, my boss found out what I was doing after we got a letter, after we were in all the newspapers for the company. And he said, you can't do that anymore. I said, hold on a second, Eddie. I said, if we stop cold turkey and we go from, I think it was 30-some seconds, uh, to a minute or a minute and a half, something's up. So we had to, day by day, every other car, we did it. And then a, a, a week later, every third car. And we slowly got worse and worse. Uh, but we were, we were fast. They like that. Why? Because people don't like to wait. People want, to, they want what they want, and they want it now. And you know who those people are? It's us. We're not patient. We don't like to suffer. And we definitely don't like to suffer long. But the Bible says that Paul prayed for them that they might have patience with joyfulness. What a wonderful prayer. Did you know that many of us will have to learn long-suffering? That's a difficult thing, but more difficult to learn to have joyfulness in patience. To be joyful knowing we can trust the Lord. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, they need you to pray for them that they would have that joyfulness, that they would have that patience. And we get angry with folks when they're not patient with us. But when's the last time we prayed for somebody, Lord, would you give them patience? Lord, help them as they suffer. Help them as they go through this difficulty and this trial. And God, give them joyfulness in the midst of it. I really believe tonight if we learn to pray for other people the way that Jesus Christ would have prayed, the way that Paul prayed, we're going to get closer to him. Lastly, look in verse 13 and 14 with me. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. I want you to notice a couple of words here in those two verses. First in verse 13. Notice the second word, hath. Who hath delivered us. Notice again there, and hath translated us. And then in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. We have it. It's been done. Can I tell you what we see here Paul praying for? Paul was praying that they might be filled with praise. You know, if I said right now, we have ribeyes cooking in the back, I'd be a liar, but you'd be happy. So, oh, woo-hoo! Well, finally, Brother Bonnie is to be excited. Can I tell you that we are filled with praise when we learn to love that which we have. So often we're like the old mule with the stick with the carrot hanging. (laughs) And we're constantly trying to get, constantly reaching forth and never attaining. When God wants you, He wants me to realize what we have already. Not what we're going to get someday. I already have it. I have redemption. The theme of the message is all day has been on redemption. When we really and truly understand redemption, can I tell you what happens? It fills our heart with praise. How wonderful it would be if we prayed for others to have praise in their hearts. If we prayed for others to know the goodness of God. If we prayed for others that they might be filled with praise. I've been talking about getting closer to God. 
So, well, Pastor, I thought you were going to give some kind of magic formula. No, no magic formula. But I believe part of being like Christ, part of being transformed, we see here tonight translated in this kingdom, is praying for others. Every one of you here tonight knows somebody that prayed for you. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a pastor. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a brother or a sister. But can I tell you somebody else that prayed for you? 2,000 years ago, the night the Lord instituted that remembrance we call the Lord's table, communion. The night that he told the disciples to remember him in the bread and in the juice. That night he went to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And there in that garden he went to pray and he took Peter, James, and John a little farther. And he went a little farther yet and he bowed to pray. It was there that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. It was there that he prayed, Father, not my will but thine. Can I tell you what else Jesus did that night in the garden? Besides putting back the ear of Malchus' servant. Besides sweating drops of blood. Jesus prayed for you. And Jesus prayed for me. In that garden. Christian, if we're to be like Christ, if we're to get closer to Him, we need to pray for one another. We need to not pray, God, make them what I want them to be, but God, help them to honor you. God, your will be done. Not my will, your will be done in their life. Let's pray together tonight. Lord, I pray you would help us. Help us, Lord, to learn to pray for others. Help us to set aside our pride. Help us to set aside our selfishness. Help us to set aside our laziness, our slothfulness. Lord, help us to set aside our uncaring, calloused hearts. And Lord, help us to learn to love others. Help us to learn to pray for others. Lord, I pray we'd have the attributes in our prayer that Paul had. God, help us to be persistent in our prayer for others. God, help us to take it seriously and be intense in our prayer for others. And God, help us as a church, a church family, Lord, to be in unity, praying for one another. Lord, not judging one another, praying for one another. Oh, Lord, I believe it would be a revolution in our church. I believe it would spark a revolution in our relationship with you if we would truly begin to pray for the needs of others. God, tonight during this time of invitation, would you help all of us to take a few moments, Lord, to set aside a few moments tonight just to pray for somebody. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, you'd place someone, a brother, sister in Christ, maybe a, a ministry leader, maybe a pastor, maybe a missionary, maybe a parent, maybe a brother or a sister. Lord, would you place someone in our hearts tonight? Lord, would you help us to spend just a few moments praying for them? Lord, loving them the way you love them learning to be like you. Lord, I pray you'd work in our hearts. Lord, if there's decisions that we need to make tonight, Lord, help us to make them. Lord, help us tonight to pray for one another. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand with me this evening? As the music begins to play, the altar's open.